My name is Kat Tao Nguyen. I am a recovering corporate lawyer. Now I have a leadership development company and I work with um, executives and uh, leadership teams around the world, helping them to find their purpose and lead with a sense of deep humanity and the intersection of purpose with sustainability. Welcome to The Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over. Tao, thank you so much for joining me. In 2015, you wrote a memoir called We Are Here, and I got to read some of the excerpts, and your life journey and your family's life journey is is incredible. Just very similar to um, a lot of the people that left in those years in the 70s and 80s. But now when I listen to the work that you've just described, I realize that nobody can arrive at doing that kind of work unless they've gone through some sort of uh, corporate life or corporate life burnout um, to get to a point where you are saying, you know what, I can give back to society in a different way. Can you tell me the journey of graduating from law school, getting a corporate job, and then shifting gears and going back to Vietnam? Yes. Um, what a great uh, question. Um, I guess, you know, when we got to Australia, um, we had extreme poverty. Um, and I remember, you know, all of us living on this mattress. Um, I remember not having enough clothes for winter. Um, I remember being laughed at by everyone in my school because I didn't have any brand named, um, athletic shoes. You know, everyone was wearing Nike and I had these like no name, pay less shoes, you know, and um, and I also experienced explicit, like, um, individual interpersonal racism, you know, from strangers. Um, and so it was, it was against this backdrop um, that there was, that fueled, I guess, why I wanted to go to law school. And there was one particular moment and um, my dad who, you know, his favourite book was Les Miserables and he was educated and he was in Australia, was working in the in the factories, and um, he had also survived a re-education camp where I didn't really know that much about his experience until I moved to Vietnam, and um, and I got bits and pieces of his experience from you know motorbike taxi men and also my uncle and also strangers who were ended up being like uh, sort of clients and corporate joint venture partners where I got bits and pieces and I started to make this, this puzzle become more complete and understand my, my father and my mother a lot more from being here. But, you know, before all of that, I was 11 and, you know, my dad had experienced a lot of um, marginalization, especially in the factory floors where people were literally like um, throwing screws into the machine that he was manning to get him fired and there was like racist abuse and he had realized that the tool to survive from Vietnam until every form of marginalization and oppression is to be silent is to swallow all of the rage and all of the indignity and keep it inside you and until it implodes or until, you know, you become just a shadow of yourself. And so the same thing happened one day. There was this, like, it reached the height of the abuse and he took a metal rod and he was going to attack the white man in the factory floor. And then, you know, he thought of us, he thought of his wife and he's like, well, if he goes to jail, who's going to look after them? And, you know, all of the expectations of him as this, you know, the gender roles, like all of those norms and everything just comes crashing down. And so he just drops the rod and he, he has to sort of submit one more time. 
And so that day he comes home and I'm 11, um, 12, and I see him sitting on this like plastic milk crate and he's really, really sad. And I said, Dad, what's wrong? Um, and, you know, stoic man never really says a lot of stuff. And then he says, in this country, I have a mouth to eat with, but I do not have a mouth to speak with. You are my voice. And at that moment, I just felt the deep responsibility to become an advocate, you know, to be the voice of so many voiceless people um, who, with their conditions, they are unable to live a dignified life and they don't have the language of, you know, their rights. And so, yeah, and so I thought, I think I need to do this, you know, for to, to, to bring this to my family first and foremost, whether it's a burden or it's a curse or whether it's a blessing, I don't know, it's all meld into one. Um, and so I felt like, okay, I'm going to go to law school, become a lawyer. And I first started working for legal aid. Um, but but shortly after that incident, um you know, we we had to sell our house. We had our first Australian dream, like the American dream, buy the house, but then we lost it and then we were thrust into, like, a lot of poverty. And um, and so after we sold the house, we had a bit of money and my mother and myself and my two brothers, we went to Vietnam on a trip and my dad couldn't go because he was working in the factories. And it was my mum's first trip back after she had left so she had left in like 78, 79, and it was 1991. And before the trade embargo was lifted with the US, right, which basically Vietnam was closed to the world. Um, so we went, we went, and we went to my ancestral lands. And that first trip was so significant for me because for the first time in my life, when I landed at the airport, all these people waiting for their relatives and everyone there looked like me. They had dark hair, they had similar eyes, and they had similar skin. And I found that to be extremely strange. And then I had a swarm of relatives just sort of, you know, pick me up and do the sniff kiss, sniff, 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 sniff everywhere, right? And then we were sort of transported on this little minivan for a couple of hours in the dark and we arrived at the wooden house on the river in which, you know, my parents got married, in which my mother, you know, as a young child almost drowned on that river. My grandfather, like, knocked the, the wooden floor and this house with deep memories and the ancestral altar that had been in the family for generations. And... And then the next day, um, sunrise, we went to the graves. So the first thing we had to do was we had to go to the ancestors. And I went through the rice fields and these graves that connected me to something way beyond my life in Sydney. And I touched the coconut trees that my grandfather had planted that towered over me and he had passed because that was my grandfather on my dad's side. And that experience, for the first time, I felt, I felt alive in a different way. I felt like I was part of a, I felt that I was part of a community but part of something that was so deeply nourishing and intangible and I felt that I could never be alone even if I was physically alone. And so when I came, when I left Vietnam at 11, I said to myself at 11, one day when I grow up, I will move here and I want to live here. And that was this commitment as this little 11-year-old girl. And so then I go back to Australia and life happens and I get a full scholarship to study a law degree. 
um, and a business degree. And um, I, you know, become a lawyer. I start working for legal aid with First Nations people as well. But then, um, you know, coincidence or serendipity or whatever, the universe, I, there's this through three degrees of separation from my family friend, my mother says there's this woman we know and she's recruiting for a lawyer in Ho Chi Minh City. And, and then before you know it, I was in Vietnam at 27, single, by myself, um, working for this international law firm and started a career in corporate law. Um, and then, you know, a few years later, I get a lot of experience and then I work for an investment fund and, you know, I was a chief strategy officer for the fund for Vietnam and Cambodia and I'm doing all these things. And then there was this, um, you know, the height of my career, right? We got big name clients, all the Fortune 500 companies setting up joint ventures. And I remember one property deal. It was about $350 million. And we were doing a joint venture. And it was a huge new urban um, urban sort of centre, I guess. And so what we have to do is we have to clear the land and clear all the people that are living on the land. Who had been there for generations, and to build these new developments, right, with concrete and steel, and you know, I I was going past the People's Committee building, so a, a, a district one in Ho Chi Minh City, and it's this elaborate French built building, um, and in front of this building. Um, which now on the side has Cartier and, you know, Louis Vuitton and Hermès, there were these elderly ladies and they had travelled from really far away in rural Mekong Delta and it was probably like five of them and they were holding protest signs and the signs were, and, you know, all protests are illegal in Vietnam, right? So the protest signs said, you know, don't take my land, um, and the sign also said, would Ho Chi Minh would have wanted, would he have wanted this? And that, that plagued me, right? That plagued me that I guess I was an instrument in enabling this. Um, and so, you know, the voice got louder, the void inside me also got louder, can, Until can I, can I stop yeah. you right there? I, I have often wondered when you are in that position yeah. as a lawyer, as mm. somebody who's at the very top of the food chain to mm. enact these sort of changes, mm -hmm. are the people really heartless, that heartless that they, like, how do you mm. live with yourself? I'm, and, and I'm asking this as a general question for people because you've sat in that chair. I have. In Vietnam, I mean, I can imagine there's a separation between like a white person and a corporate job doing that for mm. a company. But as a Vietnamese person mm. in that position, mm. what what gives? How does that happen? Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at all of the the developments and everything that has happened, right, and, and the, the, the development of, of Saigon, in particular Hanoi, this this has happened and it will continue to happen. And it's being enabled by a, an entire ecosystem, right? So you have one, you have the lawyer or the law firm, but you have the engineers, you have the architects, you have the investors that put up that $300 million, right? You have the government officials. Um, there is an entire ecosystem that functions to enable all this to happen. Now, you know, when you think about the balance of, of development versus equity or what is equitable, dignified development what is prosperity what does that mean you know and i guess at 27 28 being a baby lawyer and seeing this i probably do the thing that a lot of people do 
and then you 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 are confronted but then you you legitimize you rationalize right you start to sort of be very intellectual about um you know your your lack of power your you know well what can i do anyway you know like i uh, you know i'm just the the i'm just sort of administering but i'm not the decision maker i'm not the you know the person with all the money so you go through a process of of yeah and and i think all of that for me at that time was fueled by a way of living which was about scarcity and fear meaning you know i need to i need to make money i don't ever have enough i don't ever have enough money and you know i need to do this um for me right so you know it's sad about this other situation but like what can i do so there's this living from a base of scarcity and also being seduced by the can a very popular definition of what success means that's how you keep going yeah and it affects and devastates hundreds of lives on the ground and 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 i think that's when i read about your story and read about your journey that's the interesting part is sort of this conversion to doing the work that you do today and in that sort of conversion, there's this idea of um, leadership management that I that I see pop up over and over again uh, mm. in your in your story. Um, but how do we balance this idea of leadership and management in a country like Vietnam that has, I wouldn't say free reign to do whatever they want at the top, but at the same time there is a cultural aspect of yong lang and tunit and the way things work at the government level versus the citizens has that sort of same infrastructure same hierarchy um but how do we crack into that how, is is society really changing with the work that you do in the last few years I, i'm really curious about how much vietnam can change it culturally um, as a result of having people like you on the on the ground, mm. so what I do is I help people relearn being human, and there's a real difference between leadership and management, and I think it's extremely difficult to lead. It's easier to manage. Manage is, you know, like delegate, do these tasks, using my position of authority, um, things can get done and it's more, you know, operational and you meet your short-term KPIs, etc. I think leadership is about transformation and enabling transformation. But the foundation of that is your inner transformation as a human being. Mm. Before you can manifest the change that you want to see in the world. And, you know, one of the reasons why I set up or I co-founded and I was the founding chair of the Australia-Vietnam Leadership Dialogue was precisely your question and answering that because, you know, I was the advisory board chair of an Australian charity, education charity in Vietnam. It was a Catholic charity. We built toilets we gave away bicycles to poor families. We gave away, you know, like scholarships and we built um, computer labs and libraries in rural areas. Now, as we were doing this work, um, I just found there was no difference. There was just the set, the families just coming back year after year and I felt like I was not making or we were not making a significant difference. And I was addressing symptoms, not the structures. Mm. And, and then what I started thinking was if I took the 10 most influential young leaders under 35 who are still, I feel, malleable, if I br bring them into a life-changing transformational journey where they have to look deeply 
and think about their legacy. Think about the day that they die. Think about purpose. Think about courage. Think about impact, right? If we are able to do that, how can I then, how can we influence through them? So that was the motivating, um, I guess, objective for me to set up that nonprofit. And it's a non government, non profit um, organization. So we did that. And our delegates and Australia and Vietnam, because those are like my two homes. And we did that. And when we did that, we had delegates that really were highly influential, leading in their fields. One guy won President Obama's global IT competition. He came first. Like these are the types of people, right? One guy had 30,000 employees. Another person was, um, you know, he, the family had massive property development projects. Another one was was the top three company in terms of market share in their industry. So as they went through this program, and they sometimes for the first question, first time in their lives had to ask, was facilitated to ask those questions, then the impacts, you know, happened through them, which we might not, which I might not know precisely about. But one, one company, one guy a year later took him a year to really deeply think and wrestle and rewrote the entire strategy of the company around the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you know. And, and so, you know, I think how do we change this? I think the question is first is, you know, how do we, how do we first are solid in ourselves as individuals before we can just sort of try to think about how, what is my, my own sphere of influence and trust that that is enough and do what needs to be done with your unique set of qualities. That's a great answer. Uh, but it's also very difficult to move a whole country in the direction of, I mean, let's be frank with this. I mean, I, I think sometimes I beat around the bush and I'm so afraid to talk about it, but our culture even our parents' generation and even in Vietnam, it's it's kind of the same with this idea of, um, I don't know, there's this, we're very warm people, we're very loving people, but sometimes we don't do the right thing. And we allow, and I'm generalizing uh, as I only know how to do. As a country, you can see the moving of, money overtake what really matters to the human side of, of, of the condition, the human condition mm -hmm. side of people. Mm -hmm. How do we instill this idea of individual change when it's not present in the hundred million people that are now living in Vietnam? Or am I wrong? I mean, I don't live there. Uh, I, I, I visit often. My brother's been there for 20 years. He's an American like me, but I, I just don't see it. I, I don't. Um, and again, I don't live there, but I like to analyze. I like to talk about and, and dream about the change that you're talking about. The disease, I will call it a disease. Okay. I think the disease is not unique to Vietnam. The disease is manifesting in different ways, but if you go to America if you, which I will be going to next week, but if you're in Canada, like here or Australia, the disease is there, and the disease manifests in hyper consumerism. Yeah, right. The disease manifests in people who are, you know, working full time but do not have a living wage. They're sleeping in their cars when they're working full time. Right. There's no. The, 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 there is great income inequality. There is destruction of the planet. There is exploitation of all types of, you know, things that we say that they're resources. We call the planet's gifts resources. We call human beings resources for exploitation. We think that growth is linear and infinite, which is not possible unless something is going to be destroyed and out of balance. Energy can't be created or destroyed. 
that's si- that's science so and then this descent into it makes us even more afraid it erodes our ability to be compassionate and empathetic it you know like all the messaging about you know what is success right accumulation of wealth think about just your your own individual self erosion of a sense of community this is happening globally this is why we're seeing you know like rising income inequality we're seeing rising you know um racial <laughs> segregation actually and racism and institutionalized racism all of these things is a common disease and in vietnam it just manifests in different ways only right it's just that we've skipped a lot of the development stages of maybe company countries that have been more developed so our arrival at hyper consumerism possibly is faster right our arrival at the erosion of you know um our neighbors thank god we're still formed by a base of collectivism we're still got some remnants of that left right which is why during covid everyone could wear masks and they're not saying oh my right to not wear masks it was like you know if you're not wearing a mask it's shaming because you might hurt other people we still have those vestiges and so i'm very interested in reviving the beautiful um parts of our culture which um is actually eroding very fast right you work in this mucky world of fixing this sort of i don't want to call it fixing but rehabbing mm. the the consciousness of the human condition and on the ground floor in vietnam do you have hope do you do you are you hopeful do you see change happening <laughs> Yeah, I am hopeful. I am hopeful. And you know, one of the programs that I actually run in Australia is an 8-month racial equity leadership program. And half of that cohort is 12 white executives. And the other half of the cohort is people of color. and for the white executives they're in their own cohort and they go for 8 months and they are confronted deeply with what does it mean to be white what is white privilege what does that mean for me as a parent they are deeply confronted and they have shame they have guilt they have defensiveness they have anger they've overwhelmed they they go through all of these things and then it their heart is opened and they have a a a a person of color who is their i guess their sponsee and they intersect with them but they do their work and i am the coach and the facilitator and created the content for all of this and then at the end they arrive at a healthy and functioning sense of white racial identity in this world why would and- Why they would need the hope i guess i want to speak to the hope because yeah the hope is when they stand up in front of their ceo and the chair and they say i am racist because i have not actively participated in reducing racial inequity and even though i have not raised racist children i am not raising anti racist children and i am going to dedicate my life to justice in wherever i find myself and so that transformation with the right conditions people can transform i love hearing that and i'm also wondering why those 12 white people are joining a program for 8 months to sit and hear why they need to change i think they have like a little opening to realize that hang on why in my organization are there all these people of color at the bottom and it's 90% white at the top why is it in my country the parliament the congress looks like that too and universities and everything else 
and can I stand by that? And may, and they don't know the answers, but there's this inkling and of this is sort of not right <laughs> somehow. That sounds like very rewarding work. And the other half of the cohorts, how are they existing? They don't, they're not going through the program at the same time as the, the white uh, cohort. So they join at the same time. Um, and for them, they're sort of like future leaders of the of an organization. Um, because the organization is predominantly white at the top, they want they want these leaders to sort of be be sort of um supported and they might have quotas or targets for people of color um but those aren't enough because it can be extremely token and um you know not helpful because you know those people who are sitting then by themselves in this all white board or leadership team can be gaslit could be marginalized no one could be listening to them so you need to help them be prepared and what I have discovered is at least for people, you know, black, indigenous or people of colour in predominantly white societies like America or Australia, that for the people of colour, this program is, is very much a program of healing racialized trauma. And diagnosing to a large extent the internalized racism that they carry. And, you know, there's an amazing quote by Audre Lorde who says that the true, something like the true act of re revolution is not dealing only with the oppressor. It is removing the seed of the oppressor that has been deeply planted within us. There are a lot of us in the United States, including myself, that are unable to recognize in real time that racist person living inside of ourselves. It's hard because it's institutionalized. It's ingrained in you as a toddler. I was born in the United States 48 years ago was ingrained in me to see the world a certain way that separation takes decades to unfuck and it is not a glorious process by any means and it's a very confusing process when it's you when it's inside of you it's like a a monster inside of you and it comes and goes it's not always there but it comes and goes but it affects us in times that are probably the most crucial in determining whether we advance or grow as a human. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, interestingly, Vietnam has been a huge part of healing my own racialized trauma. And you're completely right in that from the time that you're born right? If you're in the US or I guess, you know, Canada, France, all these countries, um, there's this concept by, um, you know, Professor Smith and the concept of racial battle fatigue. And he documented and researched that for people of colour in these societies, the negotiation, the constant living is the emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion that you experience is equivalent to a soldier on the front line in a battle. And when we think about white privilege, we this is what people sort of really r struggle with. They think privilege is our being rich or whatever. It, privilege is not about having something. Privilege is the absence of of a certain type of experience, the absence of that mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion. And why is it exhausting? Because what happens when every time you open a magazine, you turn on the news, 
you watch a movie until recently that didn't have Asians or whoever as the main characters or stereotypes or whatever. You go to a school and your teacher is not, doesn't look like you. And every single public space and tiny iteration where positions of authority or influence or media or whatever doesn't look like you, there is an unconscious jab of invalidation. Invalidation, invalidation, invalidation. You're not worthy. You're not worthy. That's what happens. And you're not beautiful. And so for a white person, the unconscious other side of that is affirmation, 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 affirmation. That's white privilege. And so automatically there's a confidence unless, you know, that you might carry as a white person doesn't mean that you can't be homeless. It doesn't mean that you can't be a drug addict. Of course you can. But what happens if you are a black drug addict, a black homeless person, in addition to all the exhaustion and the, in, the invalidations, that a lifetime of invalidations? And so when I, and so your idea of what's beautiful, who's sexually attracted to you? You know, I, I know that there are people, including my husband, I say this a lot, he had internalized racism yeah. because he only dated white he only dated white women because he was like, oh God, Asian women, ill. And then Asian women who don't find Asian men attractive. Right? How are we programmed in so many ways? And so Vietnam being a big part of my healing of this is when I'm in Vietnam, I hear the mother tongue spoken everywhere. I see TV. People look like me. I see beauty pageants. People look like me. And guess what's going on? It's the same experience for a white person. Affirmation, affirmation, affirmation. And I didn't realize that that was happening for me until I returned to Australia and I was sitting in a boardroom of all white executives and it was just stark and it just put me back in my place of like, whoa, hang on, what's this reality here where I'm no longer the ethnic dominant um, group? But being in Vietnam restored, I guess, a lot of the confidence that was eroded from me because of my race and ethnicity. Yeah. And so when I sat in the boardroom with these beautiful harbour views of the top companies and CEO, I was just like, I did not have any chip on my shoulder or any reservation or any self-doubt that I had before I had moved. Oh, it's a brilliant observation. And, and, and it's very specific too, because as I have listened to you in the last um, hour speaking to me about your experiences, there's a specificity to arriving at your junction or the intersection of power, the intersection of self-realization and self-awareness, because you can't learn the knowledge that you're describing to me, that you're teaching. You know, and that's the big mystery to me as I'm sitting in front of you is there's no curriculum that's going to teach Tao how to change the world on this level. It has to be a combination of all of these life modules that have stacked up and presented you with this curriculum, so to speak, right? It's, a, it's now a curriculum. But even when I think about like the work that you've done in the past and the life that you've lived in the past, um, the conversation that we're having right now is almost very specific to people in our generation who's lived in a very white world and now a very Vietnamese world. Cause I can, I can experience what I can taste what you are describing and where we are going in terms of the world being a more equitable place for people of color has a long way to go. And, you know, this is happening in Hollywood. It's happening all over corporate America. 
And I wanted to return to uh, one of the points that I wrote down for a question for you, which is you've dabbled, you've dabbled in film and theater. And I want to know how has that informed your specificity that you've grown into today? How, cause it, it sounds like you have all of these, uh, a myriad of, of, of experiences that has really brought into focus the way you present to the world and the way you are helping heal uh, humankind. So uh, you know, I want to hear a little bit about how the film and, and theater world um, informs the way you see the world. I'm so glad that you picked up on that, like, because it's, it is such an integral part actually, because, you know, I realised through my work that um, and other people who do this leadership type of work as well is that you have to enter through the heart. You can't just help people go through transformation in an, in a mind manner only or an intellectual space because it's like if you read a book great so you read the book but but in that book people always remember the stories they don't just remember data right the data is relevant but if you go through the heart then the logic comes then the will right heart head then hands so the hands is like the sustained will to translate the aligned heart and mind into action. And so if if we go through the heart, then the way that people can be touched is through story and good narrative. Right? And when you what what you know through the the craft of filmmaking and arts and visual arts, it's about it's about a vehicle to convey a story that touches people deeply, that it reverberates on a cellular level where you have no words to even describe what you're feeling except sometimes tears, okay? And so in my work, I actually have like, you know, I curate the experiences as though it's a film, like it's a story. So, you know, I also make online modules and one of the and the modules are also made in like short film form right and then it becomes compelling and there's a tempo and there's a crescendo and then there's a you know and you follow a human emotional journey before they can get to a, fi a final position of reconcil reconciled position in the world then i can now act right so you know one of the pieces of work that I did, which is really using all these film, um, you know, craft, is um, I spent one year making um, an illustrated documentary on the history of race. Wow. And I worked with a Canadian artist and every piece of um, scene is hand-drawn illustrations and it's a global history of race. And we start to realise, wow, if we start to look deeply at the construction of all of this, we actually see there's a direct relationship between the experience of Haiti, Vietnam, Rwanda, US, Australia, France. Um, incredible. It is so connected. And so when I made that, I think people are like, my God, I can now see how we are all living legacies of four or 500 years ago that are embodied in me today. When you think about those countries and the positioning of, of the superpowers and, and the countries of color that were the recipients of these really brutal regimes and, and enterprises, do you think four or 500 years ago, it was five people in each of these countries, 20 people in each of these countries getting together and forming cabals and and actually orchestrating something like this? Or how do you think the natural evolution of these superpowers come together to actually carry out these atrocities and, and actually become very successful 
at coordinating human beings at the at the at their own top levels to carry out the the inhumanity so i think for us it's easier to think that it was these like spew individuals it's like the hitlers right oh there's hitler but actually hitler just didn't arrive like that there was a precursor of so many people from academics, scientists, um, you know, researchers, politicians, um, adventurers, explorers. There was this culmination of things that happened where all of a sudden things were normal, norms, right? What becomes norm thinking, a norm so a norm was black people are, are, have to be enslaved. Asian people need to be assimilated, need to beat their culture out of them. Um, First Nations people need to be eradicated, right? There's, there was this normed thinking wow. that wow. everyone started to digest globally. And so think about the norms that we have today and we go, whose fault is it? that there's, you know, we're using way more energy and power than we need. We're buying so much more stuff than we actually need. We live in big houses. And so these are normal now. Having more money means more success. That's a norm. Could we, can we say, oh, it's like five individuals in some country? No. no. And then so what's transgressive that seems like that's backwards is actually living in a tiny home. Oh, you must be so poor. And even in the rural areas where simple living and use, you know, using what you need only now it's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, tr I'm actually building like a house in my ancestral lands. And even the construction and the building and the architecture, the things that one generation ago they were using, that's actually naturally cooling, for example. Now it's all like, oh, that's, that's not modern. We need to use concrete and all this, which is more modern and modern means better. So then we start to go, wow, these norms now that need to be radically disrupted. So then there was a point, right, throughout history where a culmination of different people acting in their own sphere of influence moves towards an inflection point in the system. And the inflection point is where these norms break and they're not normal anymore. So I'm sorry, slavery? excuse me, blackface, whoa. But hang on, how many years ago that that was actually normal? So, you know, systems change is about people in their own sphere doing what they need to do to challenge these norms and cumulatively moving towards an inflection point everywhere. Your work sounds really exciting to me. It, it how do you scale this <sighs> that's funny that's a question that so many people ask me they're like why isn't why can't everyone do this or you know like blah 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 and it's really it's really interesting because um i have this um i had this challenge with a client because the work was so impactful and life-changing right and the client was like corporate client big corporate client you know 200,000 employees like and they're like how do we do this and then the thing is though this 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 life-changing work it then becomes hyper consumerism mm. so the difference between a handcrafted gin a handcrafted whiskey where you have the botanicals like Rhone or some a candle that you make as opposed to a mass-produced one where there's no story but there's no heart and there's it's like an artwork. Think about the artwork. One artwork where someone takes a year to contemplate and create versus a mass-produced print in Walmart, right? It's different. And the value, I think, is in the process, not in the final outcome. So for us, it's about what are we measuring here? And I think this is very similar to, you know, the climate 
justice work now. Everyone's like feeling extremely stressed and anxious. They're like, we need to scale outcomes. You know, but people haven't done their own inner work to be able to actually approach the work in a way that's not polarizing, that doesn't, you know, make people into enemies because we're just doing that. And that doesn't help. Right. So for me, I have, um, I think for some parts and some pieces of work, I have accepted because there's a cost to scale. And the cost is your well-being in some respects. So I have to sort of really carefully think about what am I scaling? Why am I scaling? What is a measure of success? And is if I change the life of one person who they come to me as a result of the program as a woman of colour and say, I am healed. I am now healed. I think that's enough for me. If I had gone through a program and if I walk out of your program, in my head, I like the funniest thought I said to myself just right now is like, if I'm half healed, I'm okay. <laughs> Anything beyond where I am right now, or, you know, my counterparts, my friends, uh, in terms of the way we view hyper consumerism and money and the big house, even if we get to half of that, mm. it would slow down the destruction of the earth substantially. Absolutely. And I think this goes back to the question of hope, right? Because what, you know, what is going to fuel real change? And I think the answer is individual suffering. Because there will be a point, I think, where a lot of people will individually realise that they're not fulfilled. And it's either, so there's different wake-up calls, so it's either dramatic, you know, health issue that puts you on the edge of life and you're like, I'm going to die, and then you recover or whatever, or you do lose someone, or it's a slow death. And the slow death is is basically a state of depression that you don't even realise that you're in, that you wake up every day and you do the same stuff and you feel that you have all the things but you know, you're not happy, right? And so or your physical conditions are really terrible because you're yearning for so much that other people have and you don't, but there's this deep unhappiness or there's a dramatic deep unhappiness. But it's suffering and pain is the doorway to change and there's going to be more of it. Yeah, I, I do see that. I do see that uh, in my life. And I know... When I came to the podcast today with you, I had prepared a lot. And I know that you have stories of suffering and pain and different things that brought you to that. But we we won't be able to get into it because of how much time we have left. And in saying that, I want everybody to see if they can, if you're interested in this conversation, to go over to Viet Cetera's um, interview with you, uh, How Tran the founder of Viet Cetera sat down with you to talk about uh, his journey, your journey in, in, in a different aspect of it. Um, thank you for, for coming on. And, you know, I, I want to tell you how much I was expecting different, you know, from that episode that you did with how, but this was a massive departure from what I had prepared. And, and, and I'm so uh, surprised uh, by this sort of, um, even more depth that I thought that I was going to get from you, but there was just so much more that um, that you brought on that I did not uh, anticipate. And for more, for people who want more uh, about sort of like um, a general view of who you are, uh, that Vietcetera episode with how w w is is uh, very illuminating. And I want to thank you again and thank how for uh, making this happen and bringing it all together today. Well, um, you know, I'm also writing a book, my second book, which I think it's bringing together all of a lot of what we've talked about and anchored by my experience of living in Vietnam for 16 years and 
moving to a point of what does it mean to heal um, in multiple ways. Um, so that will, I'll let you know when, when it comes out, but I want to thank you for this space. You know, it's a much needed space and your real, um, you know, expert skills in creating the space and creating the conversation and conversations that really matter and that need to be had. So thank you. Thank you, Tao. And will you come back after um, the book releases so we can really get into that and just focus just on the contents of the book and how that would how that came about in the world? Absolutely. Uh, it will be a joy to do. Thank you, Tao. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. Special thanks to Brittany Tran, to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast.